Praise the Lord. Well, how many of you brought your Bible with you tonight? We hold up the Bible all over the building. And I want to ask you to join me, if you will, in the Gospel of Luke tonight, chapter number th uh, chapter 4 in the Gospel of Luke. That's page number 1076, if you have an old Schofield Bible. And I want to read just uh, the first four verses of this chapter. And, uh, boy, I hope it don't do that all night long. That's going to scare me to death. But... Uh, I want to read the first four verses of this chapter, and then if you will, leave your Bibles open. We're going to look at some things together from the Bible this evening. Luke chapter number four. Now, I want to encourage you to really pray for the Lord's Day, and uh, pray that God will give us a good day Sunday, and uh, the early service, the later on service. Please pray that the Lord will meet with us and help us. And let's pray most of all uh, that folks will get saved, and the Lord will help us in these days, and encourage our hearts. If there's ever been a time that we needed to meet together and exhort one another in these days. We need that. And I would encourage you to be here. Man, don't quit now. I mean, good night. Let's stay faithful and, and to be in church and allow, allow the Lord uh, to work in our hearts in these days. Uh, Luke chapter 4, uh, beginning with verse number 1. Here's what the Bible said. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan. Now, just to stop right there and say that Jesus has just had probably one of the highlight days of his life thus far. He's at the age of 30 years old. He's went down to the Jordan River, and John the Baptist is baptizing there, and Jesus has just submitted himself uh, to be baptized. When he gets baptized, a great meeting takes place. God calls out of heaven and says, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. The Bible said the Holy Ghost, like a dove, descends down upon the Lord Jesus and lights upon him. It has been a a great day. May I say, probably been one of those red, de red letter days in the life of our Lord. So he's just come from that victorious experience by the Jordan River. And now we read that he's led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, when I say wilderness, we're not talking about some lushy green place with babbling brooks and shade trees all around. We're talking about uh, he's in a desert. I mean, with the, ja with the, the, the jackals howling and, uh, and the wolves. And I mean, it's a terrible place. He's been led by the Spirit. Why is he there? The Spirit of God's led him there. You know, sometimes the Spirit of God will lead you into some places that you wonder, how in the world did you get there? But the Spirit of God led him there. Then verse 2, the Bible said, For 40 days he was tempted of the devil. In those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he, were, he uh, afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. Evidently there was a stone there. And the devil looked at him and said, All right, command this stone to be made bread. And verse number 4, Jesus answered, saying, It is written, thou shalt, not ten, uh, thou shalt not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. I like that phrase, every word of God. Let's pray. Father, bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For the last six weeks now, we've been engaged in a series of messages that I've entitled, Great Bible Words Every Child of God Should Know. It's a series of messages that I've been preaching, emphasizing particular words of the Bible. Words that we as God's people ought to be familiar with as we live out these last days upon the earth. I've told you this before, but if you were to go through and count them, and I'd encourage you not to do that, I haven't done it. I'm taking somebody's word for what I'm about to tell you. But somebody has said that there are 788,280 words in our King James Bible. The one thing I do know about, uh, I do know about all those words is that those words are inspired by God. Therefore, every word, 788,000, plus thousand of those words, every word of the Bible is important. In our text tonight, the Lord Jesus has been, uh, he's, he's facing the great time of temptation in his life. For 40 days and 40 nights, he has not eaten there in that wilderness. The Bible said that he was hungry. You can well imagine he's in a very weakened and emaciated condition. And about that time, in rolls the devil. The devil will try to hit you at your time of great weakness. And he, and he says to Jesus,
Jesus. He tempts Jesus. And he said there in verse 3, Command this stone. As I said, evidently there was a stone there. And he said, Command this stone that it be made bread. And can I stop and say, Jesus could have easily, he could have easily done that. I mean, after all, the Bible tells us that he caused a rock to follow the nation of Israel throughout the time of their wilderness wanderings and from that rock that just followed them along. I don't think they put that rock on a wagon and just rolled it through the wilderness. I think that rock just followed them through that wilderness and from that rock, God supplied water for two to three million people in a hot burning desert. Now, if the Lord could use a rock to do that, can I tell you something? The Lord could have easily changed this rock into a loaf of bread. Can I tell you this? He could have changed this rock into a fried bologna sandwich if he had a wanted to. But in response to the temptation of the devil in verse 4, Jesus said, It is written, Thou shalt not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. In that one statement, Jesus stamped his divine approval upon every word of God. You know, I think what the Lord is saying is simply this. He's saying what food is to the natural body, the word of God is to the spiritual man. Now, we all know that we have to have food to sustain physical life. You can't live without food, taking in a certain amount of food to sustain physical life. But in like manner, you and I cannot sustain healthy spiritual life if we do not take in daily the Word of God. You know, many times on TV in our day, we see those commercials about uh, those people that are very malnourished, and they're hungry, and their little bellies are pooched out, and their eyes are set. Many times they have flies crawling on their head, and I'm not making light or fun of any of that. That is so very sad. But I think you'll all will agree with me tonight when I say that many of God's people are suffering from malnourishment as well. We are not taking in the Word words of the Bible as we should in these days. And because of that, we are suffering spiritual malnutrition. I looked up uh, just this week, just, I don't know why, but I got that thought on my mind. So I looked up some spirit, some symptoms of being physically malnourished. You can look them up there on the internet, but if you're not taking enough food, here's some things that's wrong with you. I'm talking about physical food. Here's some things that can happen to you physically. First of all, if you're not taking in enough food physically, then you have a lack of interest in life. In other words, there's no interest whatsoever in just living. You lose concentration. There's no interest in life. You know, the reason there's so little interest in the things of God in our day is because people are malnourished when it comes to the Word of God. There's so much disinterest in the things of God, even amongst the people of God anymore, and the problem is we're spiritually malnourished. We're not taking in the Word of God. Another symptom was this, you feel tired and weak. Can I tell you something? The reason there are so many tired tired Christians in our day, and the reason that there are so many weak Christians in our day is simply because we're not taking in the Word of God. The reason so many Christians can't get one spiritual foot in front of another, and the reason so many of us uh, oftentimes give in to things that we shouldn't give in to is because we're not taking in the Word of God of God. There is a, uh, uh, you feel tired and weak. Then I, I found this out. You know, if you're malnourished uh, uh, physically, that you feel cold all the time? A good sign that you're not taking enough food. I guess you just, you feel cold all the time. Boy, I want to tell you, the reason there are so many cold Christians in our day can I have an amen? The reason there are so many cold churches in our day is because we're not taking in an ample supply of the Word of God. I remember Brother Bobby Robertson saying a whole lot. Most churches, he said this whole lot. He said most churches ain't got enough fire in them to warm a chicker's feet. And sad but true, we're living in days that people aren't taking the Word of God. And the end result is they are cold on the Lord. But then they say this, a sign of being malnourished is depression. You know, if you're depressed, maybe you aren't taking in enough food. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you something. The reason there's no joy and victory in the hearts and lives of God's people is because we're malnourished on the Word of God. The cure is to get back into the Word of God. 
of God. So what we've been doing over these last several weeks is we've been looking, emphasizing some of the important words of the Bible. Now, I'm using our English alphabet, you know, uh, to kind of work our way through this. So several weeks ago, we started with the letter A, and then B, and then C, and then D, and then last week, we were on the letter E. Well, this week, we're on the letter, the letter F. Now, unlike last week with the letter E, when we found out there were six books in our Bible that begins with the letter E, there are no books in our Bible that begin with the letter F. Now, you may uh, be able to, uh, you may be able to, or you may have thought that there are books in our Bible that, that, that start with an F, but there are no books in our King James Bible that begin with the letter F. Can I tell you something? There's not many prominent people in our Bible whose name begins with the letter F. Herbert Lockyer, in his book, All the People of the Bible, said that there are 3,237 people in the Bible uh, that are named. 3,237 named people in the Bible. But when it comes to the letter F, I could think of only three people in the Bible whose name begins with the letter F. Now, you may think of more, but I could only think of three. Number one, there was Felix. Not Felix the cat, but Felix. Number two, there was Festus. And number three, there was an associate of the Apostle Paul whose name was Fortunatus. And those are the only three people in the Bible whose name that I could think of that begins with the letter. Out of 3,237 people, only three in the Bible, their name begins with a letter F. There was Felix. You know, he was the one who said, Paul, uh, he was the one who said, when I have a more convenient season, Paul, I'll call for you. He got under conviction to the point that he was even trembling, but he put it off. He delayed. Paul, I'll, I'll hear you. I'll hear you again about this, but not today. Then there was Ophestus. He's the one that told Paul. He said, much, mer much learning doth make thee mad. I mean, he said, Paul, you've lost your mind. You're crazy, Paul. I believe in all this stuff you believe. And then Fortunatus, I mean, he didn't say anything in the Bible. Three people who began with the letter F. But there are some great Bible words that begin with the letter F. Now, because of this day, I thought about maybe talking about this word, fight. I thought about talking about this word, foe. I thought about talking about this word, fear. But those are not any of my words tonight. So I want to give you four great Bible words that begin with the letter F. Now the first one is this word right here. The word for new or foreknowledge. Now, we went over that a little bit last week, but permit me, if you will, to dive into it a little bit more on this week. Now, the word foreknew or the word foreknowledge only appears four times in the whole Bible. Only four times, but it is a great Bible word. Now, let me tell you this. Our English word or the word, the Greek word for the word foreknowledge or foreknew is the word prognosis. You ever heard that word before? Prognosis? If you can say that word, everybody say it together on the count of three. One, two, three. Man, you can speak Greek. Prognosis. That's the, that's the Greek word for our English word for new, for no, or for knowledge. Now, in our English language, when we use the word prognosis, it is always in the medical sense, uh, so to speak. I mean, for instance, you know, uh, the word prognosis in the medical field means this, an informed medical guess as to the probable course and outcome of a specific disease. Prognosis. Now, we know what diagnosis is. Diagnosis is when they tell you what your problem is. But a prognosis is when they tell you, okay, based on the best information that we can attain, this is probably the course this is going to run in your life, and this is probably about how long it's going to take. A prognosis. You know, many times we'll say this. Oh, so-and-so, they've been diagnosed with cancer, but the prognosis is good. A probable outcome. Well, the word in the Bible for our, the word foreknew, foreknow, or foreknowledge is the word prognosis. And foreknowledge in the Bible simply means this, that God knows the future 
before it happens. God knows the future before it happens. God knows things and God knows events before they happen. Can I tell you this? God, God knows reality before it's real. God knows events before they happen, and God knows people before they're born. Amazing. God has four knowledge. Another word, uh, another word with a similar meaning is the word omniscient. You know, we say that. We say, boy, God is omnipotent. That simply means he's all-powerful. He's omnipotent. We say God is omnipresent. All that simply means that God is everywhere. There's nowhere that God is absent. He is everywhere. But then when we say that God is omniscient, that simply means this. God is all-knowing. He foreknows. He has foreknowledge. He knows knows the end from the before the beginning foreknowledge you know prophecy is a good indication of God's foreknowledge we say around here that bible prophecy is nothing more than history that is written before it ever happens and you and I can have confidence that God that what God says in the bible will happen because of his foreknowledge he knows the end before the beginning. You know, God never has, God never has had to say this. Oops. God never has to say, ha has had to say, uh-oh. God never has had to say, my bad. God never had to say, sorry. You know why? Because God knows with foreknowledge. There's a verse in our Bible that said this. Look at this verse right here. Shall any teach God knowledge? Has it ever occurred to you that nothing's ever occurred to God? God has never had to go to school to learn. God's never had to be instructed on any matter. You know why? He has four knowledge. You say, preacher, did God know that Joe Biden was going to get in the White House before Joe Biden was born? God knew that. Did God know that Tim Gammons was going to be the pastor of Woodland Baptist Church before Tim Gammons was there? Can I say this? Before the world was ever created, God had foreknowledge. Now, many people use that word in the wrong sense today when it comes to Reformed theology or Calvinism. Now, I've got to tell you right up front, I, I believe with all my heart that God knows who will and will not be saved. But it still doesn't change the fact that it's God's will or not, God is not willing that any perish, but that all come to repentance. God has foreknowledge. I like what I read one time. This old preacher said this one time. He said, when we get to heaven, imagine a big old ark in heaven. And when you walk through that ark on your way into heaven, on this side of the ark, it says this, whosoever will. But when you walk through the ark and turn around and look at the other side, it'll say, foreknew before the foundation of the world. That is our God. Amen. He has four knowledge. He for by the way, I'm glad God loved me and I'm glad God chose me before the foundation of the world because if he'd have waited till after I was born, he probably wouldn't have chose me. Neither would he have chosen you. Amen. He has four knowledge. Say that word with me. Foreknowledge. That is a good Bible word. So there we got it. Foreknew, foreknow, or foreknowledge. Now let's move to a second good Bible word that starts with the letter F. Not only foreknowledge, but what about this one? Flesh. Oh, yeah. Flesh. Now when we think about flesh, we think about skin and bones. We think about our bodies. Flesh. And sometimes in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, especially in the Old Testament, you know that word flesh is used a lot. In, and when it comes to the sacrifices that were made, like back in the book of Leviticus and so forth, it talked about the burning of the flesh or the offering of the flesh, the skin and the bone. But when we come across into the New Testament, the flesh, the word flesh in the New Testament, more often than not, refers not to the human body, but to the sinful nature of the human body, which we all possess, our sinful nature nature. You know something? When we're born into this world, we are sinners at birth. 
We are sinners by birth. When you and I were born into this world, we were born with a bend toward evil. Let me say it like this. When I came into this world, I was born with a sinful nature with a lean toward evil. You were born the same way. We were all born with a sinful nature, a fleshly nature. Nature. That's the reason David said this in Psalm 51, 5. He said, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, David didn't talk about, boy, his mama had an illicit affair with some man. Boy, in that, that, in that terrible affair with that dear man, that he was conceived in iniquity. He's not saying that, but what he is saying is this. Man, when we were born, we were born sinners. You know, when I was born into this world, I was born with a propensity to do that which is wrong. In fact, I was born with, with it being easy to do that which is wrong. But then after we became sinners by birth, we became sinners by choice. We choose to do that which is wrong. We have a fleshly nature. And here's the thing, when we get saved and become a partaker of God's nature, the fleshly nature don't just move out. Can I tell you something? Let me tell you what a good definition of a Christian is. A Christian is somebody that has a saved soul living in an unsaved body. And, and what that simply means is this. When I got saved, the Bible said I became a partaker of God's divine nature. God, through the person of the Holy Spirit, moved into my heart and life, and I got a brand new nature now. God's nature lives on the inside of me. But when God moved in, the, de the, the flesh didn't just pick up his bags and say, all right, I see you now. God's in there. I'm leaving. I'm moving out. He didn't do that. He still resides within us as the people of God. The Bible says this, 2 Peter 1 verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. When you got saved, God in the person of the Holy Spirit moved into your life. The seed of God remains in you. You are a partaker. You are a recipient of a divine nature. That's the reason the Bible said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. We got a new nature. The only problem is the old nature didn't walk out. The old flesh, the fleshly nature, the, the leanings toward evil, the pull that we feel. How many of y'all ever feel that pull? The pull that we feel toward that which is evil. It just didn't leave us when we got saved. We're a saved soul living in an unsaved body. Now, there, is some, there are some people who, who believe in what they call the eradication of the flesh. What that simply means is they believe that when a person gets born again, the old nature is gone. But I think those of us been saved any amount of time know by experience that's not the case. The old nature, the old flesh just hangs around looking for an opportunity to rise up and have his sinful, wicked way in our life. In fact, can I tell you something in a real sense? There's a person in this church that's been giving me trouble, and I'm going to call their blessed God name tonight. They've been giving me trouble, and I just want you to know I'm sick and tired of it. And that person's name's Tim Gammons. That boy's been bothering me ever since I was born. He gives me a fit. And if you were to be true tonight, you'd probably say, worst person in this world gives me the worst fit. Put your name right there. We have a sinful nature. The Bible teaches us that day by day, Hour by hour, moment by moment, we have to die to self. We have to, die to, we have to die to the flesh. We have to crucify the flesh. Look at these verses right here, good verses, proving the point that you put off concerning the former conversation, the word conversation, lifestyle, that you put off the former conversation, the old man, the fleshly man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And then we're told this, that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. We got a battle going on on the inside of us, our flesh and our spirit, God's spirit. 
the Holy Spirit, the, 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 the divine spirit that we received the moment that we got saved by the good grace of God. And buddy, that battle is going to go on until we reach the city limit sign of the new Jerusalem. We're going to have to battle with the flesh. Can I have an amen? Galatians 5.24 says this, and They that are Christ have crucified the flesh. Every morning when you get up, every th- what we ought to do first thing, get out of bed, is take our old flesh, put it on the cross, and just nail it up there. But let me tell you something, ain't going to be but a few hours, he's going to wiggle down off that cross and start trying to give you trouble again. But we all got the flesh. So we have the word foreknowledge, and then we have the word flesh. But now there's a third great F word or word that begins with, I ought to, instead of saying F word, I better say word that begins with the letter F. So there's, shut up. See, y'all got the flesh. See, that's your problem right there. You got the flesh. I tell a bunch of sinners in, Lord help me, Jesus, bunch of sinners in this room right here. Flesh. And then we got the third F word that begins with the letter F. Shut up. And that's the word faith. The word faith. You know the word faith appears some 247 times in the Bible. But it's only mentioned twice in the Old Testament. So 245 times that the word is used, it is used in the New Testament. Faith is basically a New Testament word. Now, there are two types of faith that are described in the Bible. There's that, first of all, the first type of faith is personal faith. In other words, that's the faith that you and I exercised when we got saved by the grace of God. The word faith, listen to this. Someone once said the word faith is defined like this. It is strong confidence and complete trust in something or someone. Or some synonyms of the word faith are these. Belief. Confidence, conviction, acceptance, or certainty. In other words, when we got saved, we were saved by grace through our faith. Now, here's the thing about it. A lot of people wrestle with the doubt of being saved. and Did I do it right? And did I really receive Jesus? But here's the thing that amazes me about faith. God requires us to put our faith, our confidence, our trust in the Lord Jesus. But God steps back and he says this, okay, I I want you to put your faith and your trust in my son Jesus who died for you on Calvary and made the ultimate payment for your sins. I want you to do that, but so as you don't mess it up, I just want to do this. I'm going to give you the faith that you need to put your trust and faith and confidence in Jesus. That's the reason we read this in Romans chapter 12, verse 3. God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Can I tell you something? When you and I come to Jesus, God said, okay, you're going to need some faith to trust Him. So here's your faith to put your trust, your confidence, your hope in the person of my Son, the Lord Jesus. Isn't that amazing? And we're saved by grace through faith. It's amazing to me. God would do that for us. God gives us the faith to trust His Son, Jesus. But now, not only is there mentioned in the Bible like our personal faith, but there's another phrase in the Bible that talks about the faith. The faith. For instance, over the book of Jude, we read this verse right here. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. Let's stop right there. So Jude said, here's my intention. My intention was to write to you about the common salvation. Now, don't, don't, don't take that word common meaning like this. You know, just whatever, cheap, everyday salvation. But the word common simply means this, the available salvation. So Jude said, what I originally intended to do is I was just going to pick up my heart And I was just going to praise God for the salvation that is made possible to all men. But he said, the more I got to thinking about it, he said, the Holy Spirit changed my mind. And he said, no, put your heart down and pick up your trump, trumpet, son, because there's more need for you to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for, what's the next word? The faith. The faith. Not your faith, but the faith. What does that mean? The faith. What's the difference between our personal faith and the 
faith. Well, the faith represents the body of revealed truths that have been given to us in the Bible. We call that the faith. Now, I have personal faith. I have put my faith and my trust in Jesus, but God said, all right, now here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand up for the faith. The faith, the revealed truths revealed to us, given to us in the Word of God. You know, there's just some things that's not up for debate. There are just some Bible truths that are just not up for debate. For instance, the virgin birth. That ain't up for debate. I ain't going to a, I'm not going to some ecumenical movement in some, uh, some arena when they bounce a ball down, uh, bounce a, a beach ball around and read from the NIV Bible and the people there don't even believe in the virgin birth. I'm not going, hey, I can't, I can't, I can't give in on the virgin birth. It's not up for debate. The faith, virgin birth. What about the perfect sinless life, the virtuous life of the Son of God? Hey, I want to tell you something. He never sinned. Not one time did Jesus ever sin. The Bible said in 1 Peter 2.22, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. He lived a virtuous, a perfect life. That's not up for debate, friend. His vicarious death on Calvary. Jesus became the substitute for you and for me. I can't, I can't, I can't fellowship with anybody that don't believe that. It's not up for debate. That's the faith. What about his, his victorious resurrection? He stayed dead for 72 hours, but 72 hours later he walked out of that tomb and declared himself to be alive by many infallible truth. How he up for debate, friend? Hey, I don't believe he swooned. I don't believe he went into a coma and when he hit the cold, the cold surface of the, of the rock that they laid him on. He revived and came back to life. I believe God breathed the Holy Ghost, breathed back life into the Son of God. And he's alive. And because he lives, I can face Joe Biden. Hey, for debate. That's the faith. I'm going to contend, struggle, strive, agonize, stand for the faith. Amen is visible return, not up for debate. Faith. So we got foreknowledge, and then we've got flesh, and then we've got faith. And then what about this one? We got the word fruit. Fruit. The, the word fruit is a, another one of those great Bible words mentioned 368 times in the Bible. And fruit is something that God desires and, require, and requires from every one of his children. God wants there to be fruit in our lives. So as we close, look at this verse. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And I have ordained you. God said, I chose you to be my very own. And now my purpose for your life, my intention for your life, is that you should go and do what? Bring forth fruit. That's the reason God saved us. God didn't save us just to carry us to heaven. You've heard me say this before. If he'd have done that, he could have sure saved himself a lot of trouble, in my case, if he'd have just saved me and carried me on to heaven. But he left me here and he puts up with me. And all my shortcomings, my failures, my sins, my faults, my foibles, all of that he puts up with because his desire is for me to bring forth fruit and that my fruit should remain. Fruit is the outward evidence of who we are, or maybe I should say it's the outward evidence of whose we are on the inside. How about, how about your fruit? Remember I was preaching Sunday morning about that tree that he cursed when he came to it, and it had leaves, but he didn't have any fruit. The Lord comes to our lives, and I think he's looking for an increase I think he's looking for some fruit in our lives. And he picks up our limbs and he examines us. And I wonder if he's found any increase, any fruit. Have all we got is all, we've got, is all that we have, is it just foliage and no fruit? Do we have every outward evidence of being a Christian? But I guess the real litmus test is, is there any fruit in your life? Because Jesus said this, in Matthew chapter 7, even so, every good tree bringeth forth what? Good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Let's stop right there and just say this. Boy, that's a scary statement, isn't it? You know, a lot of people say, oh yeah, I'm saved. I know the Lord. Of course I'm saved. Yet they're shacking up with somebody. 
they, they tell you that. I went to a door not long ago and asked the guy if he was saved. He was standing, had a can of Budweiser in his hand. Oh, yeah, man, I know I'm saved. Boy, I tell you, from the fruit you're not. From the fruit you're not. A good tree, a right tree will bring forth right fruit. An evil tree brings forth evil fruit. And then Jesus simply summed it all up. Wherefore, by their fruits, you'll know them. You'll know them. I'm not the judge. You're not the judge. It's not up to me to say who's saved, who's not saved. But I tell you what, you can tell a whole lot about a person by the kind of fruit they got in their lives. I read about this boy this week, and all of his life he lived, he lived uh, beside of his in a house, two-story house, and beside of their house was a fruit tree. And every time that his parents would get mad and send him to his room, he'd just raise a window and climb out on that fruit tree and uh, he'd scurry down and go be with his friends or whatever. One day he heard his daddy talking at the table, and he said, uh, man, that old tree... Hadn't had fruit on it in, a year, in years. He said, I'm just going to cut that tree down. And that boy said, man, I got to thinking, man, if he cuts that tree down, I don't have a way to escape and get out. So that night he went out there and he tied pears. Just tied them all over that tree. The next morning his daddy was sitting at breakfast and he said to his mama, he said, man, I tell you what, you know that tree I said didn't have any fruit on them. He said, it's an amazing tree. She said, why is that? He said, well, all these years, that's been an apple tree, and this morning it got up and there's pears hanging off of it. <laughs> By their fruit, you'll know them. So the truth of the matter is, we, don't, we can't say who's right and who's not right, but I tell you what, you can sure tell a whole lot of per, about a person by the kind of fruit that they have in their life. So there we have it. Foreknowledge, flesh. How many of you got the flesh? Faith and fruit. Four great Bible words that begin with the letter F. Let's pray. Father.